Hey guys, guess what? It's the last class video. Woo! All right. So in this last uh, in this last video, we're going to look at two major movements: um, the pop music movement and earthworks uh, movements. And um, and yeah, these are they're, they're both really interesting. So hopefully um, you'll enjoy this. Uh, so the image you're looking at right now is a photograph of artist Andy Warhol, who is probably the most well-known artist um, of the pop movement, and um, and so we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, about uh, these guys. So the pop pop art hit this the art scene with kind of a big bang in 1962, um, in a show entitled The New Realists. And I'm gonna go back. Oh my gosh, it's not going back. We're gonna go here. There we go. Um, and the new realists, and and they included artists such as Andy Warhol, um, a guy named Ta uh, Tom Wesselman, George Segal, Wayne Thibault, Klaus L. Oldenburg, whose work we'll, we will look at today, and Richard Hamilton. Um, you're looking at the artwork of Richard Hamilton right now. Um, it was a fresh, new American style, born in America, just like the abstract expressionist movement was born in the um, uh, America, and it was really quickly embraced by both dealers and the media. Um, pop artists returned to easily recognizable imagery, and um, and the the American public was really uh, hungry for that. They, in general, most people um, found abstract expressionism really hard to relate to, like I mentioned before. And and they 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 saw artwork like this, and it might have been shocking. But at least they knew what it meant. They knew they knew what the you know what they were looking at, which which was kind of interesting. Um, and and they uh, they found their inspiration, as you can see in this piece. Um, this piece is called "Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing." And as you can see, Richard Hamilton is a collage artist. He's he's uh, clipped um, images from a bunch of different sources, including you know advertising, uh, comics, pornography. I do not know what he's from. Um, you've got a, a you know <laughs> this bodybuilder guy holding a a large tootsie pop. Actually, people say that the word pop was coined um, from this particular uh, this particular collage of this this guy holding this large pop. Um, you can also see the, the he was playing with things like scale uh, with this one advertisement working um, you know adding the staircase in the room it's kind of it's kind of interesting so they, they tended to appropriate this was all appropriated imagery and they appropriated from television advertising comics commercial products and um, and yeah people could understand this um, most art critics um, didn't totally love the pop movement. Um, they felt that it would, uh, it, they, they felt afraid of pop, interestingly. They thought that it would um, threaten the survival of modernist art and high culture. And they thought the pop movement threatened to bring um, the art, high art world, down to the most base level, um, which is which is really interesting. Um, some critics felt that pop quote glorified mass culture rather than crit critiquing it, and and that pop quote substituted novelty for originality. Pop confused the very issues of standards in art, high versus low. You know, like is advertising, which uses artwork, is it high art or low art? And our critics were saying, no, that's low art, and artists shouldn't stay away from low art. Um, and, you know, keep in your lane, right? At, at this lofty goal of, uh, you know, of, of real art, of, of genuine art versus advertising, um, for instance. Critic Herbert Reed complained that pop lacked the heroic or mythic dimension that real art should have. Hilton Kramer, these are all um, critics, wrote that pop's social effect is simply to reconcile us to a world of commodities, banalities, and vulgarities, which is to say, in effect, indistinguishable from advertising art. So you can see they didn't love it very much. 
Um, pop artists also understood the art of self-promotion and promotion in general by actively putting themselves in the public eye. Um, you might, you guys probably don't remember this, but Andy Warhol um, once said that soon everybody will be famous for 15 minutes, um, which, which was kind of an interesting idea, right? That's so true, right? In our culture, which, uh, which um, Andy Warhol didn't live to see, the, you know, the culture of Instagram and TikTok, where people do get their 15 minutes of fame. Um, but Warhol was, we had a pretty clear eye about that, which is kind of interesting. So for the very first time, contemporary art also became big business big money and could make these artists into media stars in their own lifestyle lifetimes. So all of these guys made it big and a lot of their artwork was easily reproducible. They sold um, these, these pieces in great numbers and made a lot of money. So let's talk a little bit about Richard Hamilton. Um, so he's the artist of the one we're looking at right now. He um, had his beginnings as a designer and he felt that art's traditional place in society had been taken over. You know, the art was the thing that, that um, set standards, pushed boundaries, caused things to call things into questions, um, gave ideals of beauty, set the aesthetic for our culture. He, he thought that media, television, movies was, giving, was taking over that job, that art had lost that position. Um, and so Hamilton's solution to this problem was to use the very same methods that the advertising and mass media used, uh, and, which is kind of interesting. Um, he, to be making that artistic statement using the media, um, using kind of the, the voice of the, of not the enemy, but the low art. Um, and so, of course, the title of this is very much like an advertising. You know, what makes it, what just makes the, the homes today so different, so appealing? Um, and not like advertising we would use, but like advertising that was used in the 50s, um, for sure. Um, so this lollipop, which look, is very phallic, is the, uh, is the iconic image that is um, credited with giving pop its, um, its name. But another, another, um, another, other critics, uh, of course, uh, you know that this word pop is, is short for popular, so popular art, popular, um, popular images. And, you know, and it might be that this is a, um, you know, a, a negative comment on the mass media. All right, so let's look, uh, uh, um, Hamilton's piece is not in the AP, but Warhol has a piece in the AP. Um, Andy Warhol is a really interesting character. Um, born in Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania, he started out as a commercial illustrated, uh, illustrator before launching his fine art career. He obviously drew from popular, popular culture as well as commercial culture. Um, and, and often he chose objects that um, epitomized the values of his middle-class upbringing in Pittsburgh. Um, his medium, and it's hard to tell from this, but his medium was silkscreen, and this is a silkscreen reproduction of a Campbell's tomato soup can. Um, and it reflected um, the consumerist aspect of our culture. It also gave him great freedom for variations on a theme, and often made the pro whole process more profitable, because he could create multiple images of um, of one object and pop and maybe do it in several different um, colors. All right, um, this one uh, is called the Maryland Diptych, and this is actually the AP piece. So we'll spend a little bit of time looking at this one. He not only um, copied mass media like the like the consumers brands like Tomato Soup, um, but he also used icons of popular culture um, like Marilyn Monroe, definitely an icon of the culture at that time. Um, the diptych here that you're looking at shows 50 images of Marilyn Monroe, and I'm assuming you guys know who Marilyn Monroe is. She was an extremely popular actress um, in the 19, in the middle part of the century, 1940s, 1950s, um, who uh, eventually died um, of an overdose. And um, yeah, she was, you know, kind of a classic bombshell, blonde, very busty and curvaceous. She sang and she acted, um, but she was mostly known for just being this beautiful, sexy woman. Um, but she did, in fact, uh, you know, she lived very much in the public eye for a great deal of time um, until she finally uh, died. 
and and that and of course this was made um, posthumously. So this was made by Warhol in 1962 after she had already um, passed away. Um, you'll notice that in these this 50 these 50 images of Marilyn. It's a diptych, which you guys are familiar with. Where have we seen this? Where have we seen diptychs before? The church, right? Of course, the church. The diptychs and triptychs are what what they use to do decorate the altar pieces. And he did this very much on purpose. He chose an image. He chose this uh, this form diptych, which is very religious. Um, and he was actually raised um, Catholic, so he was very steeped in uh, Catholic religion uh, tradition. And so he wanted it to evoke this idea of um, a church icon. Um, like the Madonna, which is, which is kind of interesting. So, so he took the Marilyn same photograph, which he silk screened 50 times um, in color. Well, actually kind of in color. So doing, doing, so basic same black and white image. On the, on the, on the right side, he left the image black and white printed in various different um, uh, lightnesses and darknesses, and then on the on the left side, he added um, color for the face, the eyes, the collar, uh, and the mouth and hair, uh, and the background. So he he added um, several other hits of color uh, on the sil silk screen to kind of um, fill it in or paint it in. But you can see that this is a naturalistic color. This is a uh, very um, uh, almost roughly uh, comic book-like flat um, areas of color that have been um, added to very particular um, parts of the photograph, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, he also wanted to make a piece that was really big, and this is a really big piece. Um, each each side, each of each of these are six feet tall by four foot nine, so it's really big. Um, so it's like almost it's like nine feet across and and six almost seven feet tall. So it's huge. And with that, he was influenced by the abstract expressionists and how big their pieces were. Um, he, so he used photography, which you can burn onto a screen, and then he used the process of silk screening, um, which. It's hard to describe what that is. It's a cool process. Those of you who are artists, you should definitely um, try fiddling around with it. I got a chance to do actually this little artwork behind me is a silk screen that I made while I was in grad school. Um, silk screen is a really cool um, is a really cool process of printmaking. And um, one of the interesting things about this, just like all pop images, is that it isn't original, right? The basic image is a photograph that somebody else took which Warhol appropriated. Um, and this is an important term here, appropriation. Um, and this is, a, the, so it's the pop artists that start with this idea of appropriation. So it's not the same as um, inspiration. Oh, I was inspired by, you know, the, the Renaissance or the Baroque painters. No, they're actually taking actual things and using it again. And that is actually something that has become very common in our culture, our modern day, our current day culture. Um, appropriation is all over the place, whether it's art, music, sampling is a huge art form. Um, it's part of our culture now. But when uh, Warhol did it for the first time, this was not done. And people didn't know, um, didn't know uh, about it. And they, they you know, the, these critics, you can see, they thought he was just stealing people's uh, imagery and not being very original, um, which is interesting. So you'll notice that the, the, that the black and white side kind of goes in strips. Some are really super dark and some are really light. You can almost, um, you can almost uh, not see her. Um, and you'll also notice that, um, that this, is, this is on purpose, of course. Um, and he wanted to give it a, a kind of a uh, more um, handmade quality so that it didn't look machine made. So that it, it would seem obvious that he had um, even though it's a mechanical reproduction of the photograph, he had done it by hand. And it also, as her image fades off on the right side, it also, you can also, it, it gives it a ghostly quality, which kind of evokes the fact that she um, has, uh, is dead. Um, and on the left side, he used these, like I mentioned, um, these not very natural colors, the bright blonde, the kind of super baby doll pink face that she has on and the bright turquoise eyes and and um clothes uh some one critic uh or 
one person in a textbook called the colors of the color, like an embalmed dead person, um, which is kind of interesting, again, um, referring to the fact that this is a posthumous um, set of portraits. Um, so, it, so it's kind of interesting. So you guys probably don't know about the circumstances of Marilyn Monroe's death. Um, she was involved with quite a few um, different prominent men, including, um, you know, it was never publicly confirmed, but I, it was quite clear that she was having an affair with uh, President Kennedy at one point and a bunch of other different people. I mean, she was under a great deal of public scrutiny uh, and, um, and eventually um, succumbed to all that public scrutiny um, with, you know, just, just enormous pressure as this star that was, you know, had to be on all the time. Um, and, and it's interesting that as public, we don't really think of her death as a tragedy. Um, you know, we, we, we think it, it's hard for us to, to imagine what it would have been like to be her and how um, her public self um, was, was so difficult that it kind of, you know, sacrificed her private self, um, which, is, which is kind of interesting. And it also goes again to this whole um, diptych thing. So, so here we are, we've got, we've got this repeated images of an of a American movie star icon who died, who killed herself. You know, she wasn't killed by somebody else, she killed herself. Um, but I, with this idea of the, the, uh, this church-like diptych, you know, is he saying um, maybe uh, that, you know, that we killed her, that somehow she sacrificed herself for us, for the public, um, that kind of ran, ran her under, um, under the, you know, the, you know, the grill of, of our public uh, scrutiny, um, which, is, which is really kind of interesting. So why multiples, you guys? This is, a, this is a, not an easy question. I've just given you a whole bunch of information about this, um, about this piece and, and, the, and the, um, its religious, potential religious overtones. So I, have a, so I have a question for you, and I've already talked a little bit about size, the size of the piece, but why so many, why the multiples? What's important to um, Warhol that, to, to not just make one image of Marilyn, but multiple images of Marilyn? Why that? So answer me the question here on VoiceThread. Answer me the question about multiples. And his artwork has to do a lot with multiples. He often, he almost rarely did just one. So let's, let's look through a few other pieces. This is another of Marilyn done with different colors. This is um, El uh, Elvis Presley, <laughs> say Elvis Costello, El Elvis Presley, who was another very famous uh, sing, you know, he was a musician and a, a movie star. This was him in one of his, uh, his Western movies. And this is another of his, uh, that was a really uh, large a silk screen of um, a, a photograph that he did not take. This was a, a photograph taken by somebody else, but he made a very, very large silk screen of it to, to kind of publicize, publicize it of the Birmingham race riots. And this, of course, is the police sicking their, uh, their police attack dogs on, um, on the people who were, um, who were rioting, who were, who were protesting. Um, so, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, Warhol was not, uh, was not only about uh, the banal. I mean, he was about stuff um, that meant something too, which is, which is kind of interesting. All right, so let's move on. I'm gonna I'm gonna go over a couple of other folks that are a little bit um, not on the exam, but also really important guys um, to know. Um, this is uh, the art of Roy Lichtenstein. Um, who was another pop artist, and you can tell that his uh, his inspiration was comic books, and in particular, his inspiration was newspaper comics. And you guys probably haven't even looked at a newspaper. I don't know unless your parents used to get newspapers. But almost nobody does anymore. But if you ever looked at the Sunday comics, um, you would see that in order to save uh, money, the newspapers print the color comics with these um, with these dot patterns. And they don't use solid color as much as they use the dots. And they do that to save money, which is interesting. And these are called um, moray 
patterns. Um, and he used this moray uh, dot patterns uh, to, to illustrate his, his large scale paintings that were absolutely modeled after um, kind of comics um, and to, to kind of further evoke that fit, that feeling of the newspaper. And his, his, his are great because these are all one-off images, but they all looked like they were ripped out of a story, right? So like as if you're, you're, read, you're like in the middle of this narrative, like, but the whole story is contained here in this one image. And, and you, you, the viewer, are, are kind of left to fill in, fill in the story, like, no, oh, what happened to this woman and Jeff? And you know, she loves him, but, but, what, but what? why can't she be with him? So it's kind of funny. So uh, Lichtenstein is playing with this idea that, that we, as the viewer, are super happy to fill in whatever the narrative might be. And he can provide us a, 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 just a single image that we can then fill in. Here's another one. This one is called Wham. I love it. <laughs> and here's another one. I don't care. I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, so again, you know, a lot of the same art that we've been talking about has been narrative in form, um, but here they're 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 really going ahead and allowing themselves to to work with the uh, um, work with the popular media and and raise that level up, that level of art, that style of art. All right, so we're looking at. Uh, I hate not to talk about this this kind of art. This is Judy uh, Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party. It's not a pop piece. Um, but it just it seems is resting here. So I'm going to go past it and apologize for not covering it. Okay, there were also sculptors um, in the pop movement. Um, one of the leading sculptors in the pop movement was a, uh, a Swedish born guy named Klaus Oldenburg. Um, he took a um, he took the point of view that was both humorous and critical of modern culture. He objected to the kind of clean modern lines of all the new buildings and the sanitary conditions of life. And in this case, I think he was uh, objecting to the war and our recent, uh, our recent wars, uh, including um, the Vietnam War. Uh, this was a sculpture that he uh, made uh, that, that was um, made in, for Yale University and it still exists there at Yale. Uh, it's, a, it's a sculptural outdoor installation. And originally um, the lipstick um, was a soft sculpture, uh, a plastic soft sculpture. And I can show you maybe some, here's another image of it. Oh, here it is. Here's a picture of the original with the plastic soft sculpture. This is an image of Klaus Oldenburg. And here's some other images of the lipstick, which, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty funny because when you look at it this way with the, um, in, with the plastic um, lipstick, uh, you can see that, of course, it's a super phallic symbol, but you get to see it also in its kind of deflated state, um, which, is, which is actually pretty funny. Um, okay, so let's go back to this one. Um, so he, was, he wanted to humanize um, our world. And he was also, and Yale, by the way, was his alma mater. So um, he constructed the, this, uh, this lipstick uh, with the help of uh, Yale architecture um, students and he delivered it under cover. Oh, so I'm sorry, it wasn't a commission. It was like a prank. He, he, he uh, placed it there and of course Yale has kept it, um, but he delivered there under cover of night. Um, in the university's main square um, across uh, from the office of the president to call attention to what they called the second American um, revolution, which, which, and he was referring to as the protests against the Vietnam War and the cultural revolution at that time. It never was intended to be permanent. Um, and and it's so and it, he did end up making the um, a permanent one out of 100% uh, metal, um, though it may uh, it you know it was it was definitely meant to poke fun at them. It was also meant to be critical. So so you guys, I want you to look at what he, what Oldenburg has put together here, and I want you to think of it um, both the lipstick in the form that it is, and if you scroll forward the lipstick in the form that it was as well. 
Uh, and I, I want you to tell me about what image he's, he's putting together and what he's trying to say. You know, this is during the Vietnam War. This shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> um, yeah, so why lipstick? What's the lipstick on? Why a deflatable lipstick? And and you know what's he saying? What's he saying about the war? And why is he why is he conflating um, these two you know things, the tank and the and the and the lipstick? What you know what does what does the lipstick have to do with it anyway? Um, so <clears throat> anybody who um, thought that pop, although it definitely draws on popular culture and though draw, does draw on everyday objects, um, it didn't always have an everyday, uh, everyday meaning, uh, which, which, isn't kind of, which is kind of an important thing. Okay, so you're answering that question for me on VoiceThread. Here's a few other pieces of Oldenburg's work. This is a really early piece of a hamburger, a soft sculpture that he made. This is a very large sculpture. It's a big um, spoon and a cherry in a pond. This one is actually um, at uh, in on the mall in Washington D.C. And you guys might not even know what this is um, because it's so old-fashioned. <clears throat> but it was actually an eraser, like a rolling eraser. You could erase a line of writing, and then the little tail thing was to sweep away the eraser crumbs. Um, this is really large. It's well over life size is probably 20 feet tall um, and so and that was one of the things he liked to, to do with his sculptures was make these everyday objects in these um, scales and these places that were unexpected just to, to get people um, out of um, out of thinking the way they normally did all right we're going to move on to our next artist and we're looking at her work right here and it's really hard to tell what it is from this photograph and maybe it's also hard to tell what it is from this photograph. But maybe it's easier to tell in this photograph. This is an image of the artist. Her name is Yayoi Kusama. She's a Japanese artist. Um, and she is a really, really interesting character. Oh my gosh, I don't have, I'm gonna pause this and come back because I have another picture that I need to put into this. Um, this uh, shelf that I want to show you. So hang on. <laughs> 